there now, but um, it is certainly something we're working on now. And, and, and it is only going to be a couple of weeks at the maximum before things will be available at a grassroots. So, you know, again, to anyone on the call, when we talk about community leaders, this is definitely something we want to do to promote community groups and support you. And if you are part of a community group, then definitely we want to help you and that community grow and have some autonomy and strength and, and not be in a situation where it all funnels through to one grand you know, central slab. So I'm sorry it's not there yet, but we are doing it now, yes. Great, thank, thank you, Frank. Uh, okay, Montana, you're unmuted. Uh, if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, yes, hi, Frank. Um, I've been reading through your site and found very interesting the uh, the seven writs of the apocalypse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> boy, it's a hard one. And, and I'm a part of about 30 people now who, <laughs> since November 7th, for the first time heard of you and what you're offering for us to uh educate ourselves and so that we can become competent, is it leading to the age to collapse, have a critical mass of competent people united in spirit while we're still flesh and blood, living, breathing spirit beings on this planet, to collapse that and usher in the new age? I mean, it's... Boy, it's yes. hard to. Yes. Is that is that where you're going with it? With these, um, the four horsemen that you know, the seals and and uh, it's a it's a lot to wrap your your mind around in those treaties that you you put forward. Well, yeah, let's let's let, and I'm glad you asked those questions because let's cover a few of those things. <clears throat> um, I, I I'm an absolute believer. Firstly, I, I absolutely believe in the divine creator. I believe that we are divine and mortal spirits. I believe that the essence of, of all that we've been taught, uh, there is a strong grain of truth. What I have come under, to understand is that uh, I have had to learn not to see things from my perspective as, as a child, where I take something literally, but when I learn that sometimes what has been prophesied has a much bigger meaning to it. Now, let me give you two, three examples of that um, that go to the heart of that and support and hopefully give um, some peace and, and some comfort, but also some inspiration to you, to your group and to everyone else on the call. And the three I'm going to do is the dead shall rise, uh, the beast, and, um, and the uh, concept of the four horsemen in notorial procedure. So... The dead shall rise. It is the most, I've said this before, but it, it's worth saying again because I think it's relevant. When you read scripture, arguably the most powerful message that we're taught is that a day will come when the dead shall rise and we shall see it for ourselves with our eyes as a miracle before us. Now that's a pretty big promise, particularly if you believe in physics. And physics tells you that once the body is decayed, uh, and, and the body is in, in a putrid state, the chance that it can reorganize itself and come back to life is zero. So here we have this conflict between uh, belief in, in an emphatic promise, a deep promise of, uh, of prophecy, and what we see. Well, let's go through that. And I'll try and do this quickly, but it's important. So I want to do it and do justice to it. If you believe in hell, then you believe there's war still in heaven. But also, if you believe in hell, then you believe there is a place worse than being dead, and that is a place of perpetual torment. So if it is a matter of a covenant in bringing to end a madness where an eye for an eye can only be resolved with another generation of blind people until we're all blind, the answer is when divine compassion steps in and ends the mental illness that has turned Eden and paradise into hell that honours our ancestors and honours our faith and our belief in what has been promised that we believe is divine. So if hell ends, then the dead... Sorry, one sec, one sec. Sorry about that. 
Um, so if we believe in that, then then the end of, of hell, the dead are rising. They're rising to a united heaven. So technically, the prophecy of the end of days when the dead shall rise is fulfilled. Now, <clears throat> that's for most people that's fine, but it, it sounds like a bit of trickery in the sense that it doesn't really address this physical miracle. Well, tonight we've spoken of Sesta KV. The Sesta KV concept is that we're all dead, lost, abandoned. When we smash the lie, and the lie is smashed every time one of you and anyone that hears this call sends an ecclesiastical deed poll to anyone that has demanded an unfair right. Because that deed poll is not just your deed poll, it is a deed poll from the divine saying, you are lying, you are in dishonour, and the, and the ecclesiastical, and the, sorry, the SESKV trusts are unlawful. When enough of those deed polls are issued, those Sesta KV trusts are dissolved. And when the Sesta KV trusts are dissolved, the physical dead, our souls that we look in the mirror, shall rise from being dead and be living again. We will witness the miracle of the dead living, the dead rising in front of our eyes. Now that is an awesome fulfillment of prophecy. Awesome. But let's go one step further. We're told in Revelation that the end of days will see the beast rising from the sea onto the land. Well, what are we talking about with maritime law? What is maritime law? Mari, sea, timio, fear, fear of the sea, fear of the holy sea, amity law being applied on the land to us as vessels. The beast is the bar association. The beast are the grim reapers. Their courts are the courts of the beast on the land as if we were still under the sea. So truly the existence of those black-robed gala is evidence that we're at the end times. Now, there was one more. Um, it usually happens to me. I forget when I'm on a, on a roll. Uh, but it was, um, uh, oh, yeah, the four horsemen. Well, a horseman, if you think of the Wild West, was the fellow, the folk that actually delivered the mail. So as, as frightening as the four horsemen of the apocalypse are, let's think through natural procedure. If I'm the divine creator and I want to give notice that those who are mentally ill that run this planet like a prison have had their time. The time is up. I need to give them an offer, a consideration, even though they've been awful, I still need to give them an opportunity to cure. Otherwise, it's not notorial. It's not fair. That time comes and they ignore it. Well, December 21st of this year is the deadline for the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, to come back and say, we're sorry, we're, we, we will fix things. Come December 21st is the Notice of divine protest. The second horseman arrives. Well, you were given a year, a whole year, to cure. And you can't help yourselves. You keep setting up fear campaigns. You keep setting off bombs, funding terrorism, running false flag operations, you know, um, poisoning the food supply. Protest, okay? You are in dishonor. You have one final and one final opportunity only to cure. That's a notice of divine protest. Still, we're dealing with severely mentally ill people, they won't cure. Come the third horseman, the third notary, the day of judgment. A default judgment has been issued against you, just as any fair natural procedure, by the divine. You were given two chances. They were sent these notices. They've been given every opportunity and they still will not change. How long do you want to give them? Another thousand years? I think four years. I thought four years was outrageous. But if you think about it, four years is a long time to fix something up if, if you are in default and if you're in dishonor. So four years is plenty. Default judgment, the default judgment's against you. 
come the day of redemption, they are reaped. So there's three examples where if we look at things in a bigger frame, if we see things as adults and not as, as the literal, then all the signs are there and none of it is crazy. In fact, the craziness is not to seize this opportunity. The craziness is not to trust that what we were told is true and that we have today the power to make this happen. And that's exactly what we're doing. So I know that was a long answer, but I thought those elements were important to say. So thank you for the question. Thank you. It, uh, uh, it it gives you another way to look at the dead. And, you know, uh, you hear scripture recorded, the dead in Christ shall rise. We've all been dead. <laughs> uh, you know, we are not to act as fictions. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's all about a balance. And a yep. balance means that you, I, I now see that in, in that balance with in law, uh, you have to have that redemption offer. Yes, and you and and you need to stand as competent because when you stand as competent in the law, you are proving the living law exists. Yeah. Well, you're proving your awareness. That's right. That's right. All well, right. Thank well, thank you for your question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Okay. Next, we have a caller. That's on the list here as me, Hutch. You're uh, unmuted. Yes, that's me. This is Mariella. Can you hear me? Hi, yes, Mariella. Hi, Mary. Hi. Um, great call, Frank. This is this has really been what I needed. Um, really got down to the basics and put all the pieces together. So that's that's really been good. But I would ask you one question. You mentioned when talking about the deed poll and about the court systems. Um, and I can't remember exactly what you said now, but it made me think when we're dealing with the deed poll and and have and we present this to a court system and and I think you said that that most of the judges are aware of what this is all about, so I wanted you to address that just a little bit more sure well, when you issue a deed poll, it shouldn't be on the expectation that they will jump six feet and, and do the right thing. Okay. In fact, I, I, would, I would suggest the opposite. <clears throat> and I'd even go so far as to, to, to raise this. Our, our long-term goal <clears throat> and the honest truth is not that people who are suffering mental illness are going to suddenly cure themselves. In fact, there will come a time very soon where they just won't even pretend to follow their own laws and literally they will be in complete anarchy. But when that day comes, then no longer will they be hiding behind the law and everyone will see that. And that day will mark in days the transition to a new form of law and a a fair form of law and a just form of law. So uh, we should always presume when we do this that the reaction isn't necessarily going to be the right. It will be based on ignorance. But here's the point. Just as the only court that you ever go to that is actually formally a court in their system is when you have three judges. You don't see three judges when you first go to court. You only see three judges when you file an appeal. In other words, it's only when you challenge will you actually enter a true court, a tribunal. Yeah. So I, I would say that uh, most judges have a basic understanding of trust. And most judges will know when they're dealing with someone formidable that it's best to err on the side of, of, uh, of uh, caution and let things pass. So your competence is singly the most important tool and weapon you can have. That's why I've just gone over and over and over this is- issue of being competent in the law by knowing the essence of the law, which is presented now. Uh, but hopefully that answers for you, Mary Ellen. Um, I don't know if that has. Has that answered your question? Yeah, that, that does, and, and that's kind of the feeling that I had. But I was just, it was just going through my mind, um, and, and and I think you you make progress by, you know, watering the field, and you just start putting it out there and see what happens. But I but I think what you're saying is that 
their their knowledge and, and wisdom about trust has has got to be pretty strong. Um, 